uh, I thought I was the only kid waking up looking at Kung Fu Sundays, like literally Black Belt Theater. Look, look, I thought I was that only brother out there doing it as a little kid. Come to find out, there were more people just like me out in these streets. And it's and, and as my world, the universe starts to grow, I'm realizing there was a, a lot more people that, that's taking off their hat saying, yo, that was me too, right? You know what I'm saying? Welcome back. Welcome back. We are on another episode of Into the Last Dragon with your host, Roy Rob in the building. What's Before we jump off into today's episode, let's pay some bills. This week's episode is brought to you by St. Charles MMA. You can visit stcharlesmma.com and mention Roy Rob and Into the Last Dragon when you sign up and get a free month of training. Now, let's get into some martial arts. Today, I have an individual who is out here doing his thing on a major level, major accolades going out to this young man. He has been on his grind, uh, moved away from St. Louis and then transitioned and, uh, to another level. That upper glow is what I call it. Uh, he's done his thing on the martial arts side, Brazilian jiu-jitsu side. He's done his thing on the UFC side. He's done his thing on the training side. My man, my fraternity brother, my uh, good friend, Mr. Greg Howe. What's up, brother? What's going on, Q? What's going on, dog? It's, it's it's a pleasure to see you, man. Reach out with you, man. I uh remember when we first uh first met. Uh, I think it was a an event at Mike's. Uh, uh Mike's. Uh, last, give me his last name. Mike, Mike Rogers. 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 Yeah. Mike Rogers. Yeah. It was uh it was at his home when training was actually in the basement. Right, you know, so you had like all of these world level UFC guys in the, in the basement. I remember uh, us meeting there. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yes, How's sir. everything? Man, it's good, man. It's good, man. I, I've been extremely blessed. I've uh, started this new venture where I get to talk about something I'm passionate about and I love something that that uh, I thought I was the only kid waking up looking at. Kung Fu Sundays, like literally Black Belt Theater. Look, look, I thought I was that only brother out there doing it as a little kid. Come to find out, there were more people just like me out in these streets. And it's and, and as my world, the universe starts to grow, I'm realizing there was a, a lot more people that, that's taking off their hat saying, yo, that was me too, right? You know what I'm saying? Right, no, it, I mean it's it's crazy how you said it because it was like uh it was like a secret society so to speak. Like right. you know if you watch when you watch the movies, you know like uh like the the special technique is always done in silence and secrecy and you only bring it out at these certain times, right? So I kind of right. feel like it was kind of like one of those things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh but yeah, I, I actually have a really intimate um uh, relationship with the uh well, what they call Black Belt Theater for me in my oh, time, right? Okay, so, okay. Um, so, so, so the way my memory serves me, and, and you know, you could give a give or take a couple of details. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to go to my uncle's house. Um, and that was Uncle Cal, and my other uncle, which uh, was his name, was Uncle Charles. Like, I came from a single family, so on the weekends, go to my uncle's, and uh, we would go to his house, and we would do our chores, yard work. You know, it was a it was designed to man us up on the weekends, right? Because he had a son that was my same age. Yeah. Uh, his name was, yeah, his name was Darian. So we would do like the yard work, you know, seasonal chores, whether it be like raking leaves. and So, yeah, so we would do our chores and then we would come in. Now, while we're outside doing the chores, my uncles were watching Black Belt Theater and drinking. <laughs> All so, right. So, so by the time, and, and, you know, who knows what they were doing? They could have been in there drilling techniques and uh doing whatever with each other you know and then when we came in we were the ookies (laughs) you talking judo (laughs) language right now so listeners right now he just said a term that's in judo term uh, uh, uki is an individual who is a practice partner so if you don't if you're not familiar on that martial arts level ookies is that practice partner so you got trained at a young age huh well, well, I, I guess um, so. That, it depends on what what you consider uki. So technically, to say training partner, but the way I understood it, because I learned judo from a Mongolian Olympian, it meant pretty much throw dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe that. 
Hey, hey, so so tell me, man. So basically, you got these two uncles whooping on y'all. Is that right? Yeah, so here's the deal. It was never done from a square up uh, point of view. It was always done based off of, you know, like, for instance, we come in, we put the bags down, and soon we turn around. You got one of these in your face. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, man. How old were they? How old? Oh, How so old we, were, we were, so we were about, from, so from about 11 to 14, 15-ish, they had to be like 35, 36. My Uncle hey, Cal was um, jacked. That he was jacked, you know. My other uncle, he was kind of small, but um, they were in the primes of their life, you know. They're in the yeah. primes of their life. So, you know, know anything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anything was possible. Yeah. No doubt, man. So, all right. So, tell me, man. So, that was your introduction. Like, were you allowed to watch the Kung Fu movies with them? Or what made you transition to martial arts after dealing with that beating every once in a while? Right. So, um, so that the beating was actually every weekend, actually. <laughs> Dang. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and there was, um, yeah. So, I started getting books. You know, I started getting books because I me personally, I was like, man, I need to figure out how to stop this. That's right. all I want. I couldn't tell my mom, you know, couldn't, you know, so I was forced to go here. So I'll get magazines and um, I would look at these techniques and I would, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I would just try to you know, do what I saw in the magazines. Right. And right. I got involved um, with boxing on and off. Actually, actually, let me tell you my first, um, actually my first experience. I was in Chicago, Illinois. So I was born in Chicago, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, my dad still lives in uh, Park Forest. But uh, I remember, and my mom talks about this to this day, I went to karate school. I was wanted to take some karate. And the first day I walked in, they were doing board breaking. And I saw I got a hold of board and broke it. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom said uh there was there was no there was no more karate for me oh right? that's <laughs> comedy how old how old are you then are you a teenager then or not nah? oh, no 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 i'm like four and a half five oh, years old that's crazy no doubt no doubt and so um no I, I dabbled um there was this club you know we would we would go and wrestle at when i was younger but i i wouldn't even I wouldn't even call it wrestling because it was just like some men from the neighborhood. You're talking about, yeah. you know, North Carolina. You know, they were like football coaches. You know, they got a little stipend. There was like a kid's, little kid's enrichment thing. I did that for a couple of years. You just yeah. sitting there getting tossed around. It's more so personal training. You know, they, for yeah, what yeah, they yeah. don't know, they make you do physical conditioning. <laughs> you know, supplement it, right? Yeah. So, and so, um, you know, dabbling in some boxing and some some other things like that. And did you play um, sports in? Did you play sports in high school? Absolutely, yeah. I played. Um, I did track. I did wrestling in high school. I did football. What else? I did. I did some other weird sport. It was like uh, I forget the name of it. It was like a uh, gosh, what was it? So so pretty much, you have like this square, and you have to hit this ball in a square without touching like the cones or whatever. It, it's really weird. It's really, I forget the name of it, but it's just a, something I shouldn't have been doing. It's just a waste of time. <laughs> I ain't never heard it. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so um, I took a year off of college because of I had some grade issues, right? So I'm at home and I was wrestling a lot with this uh, guy named Marty Fazerman. All right, so he was... Um, he was a all American from gosh, it was a Division two program. I want to say Furman, but don't quote me on that. But is he an old school guy? So I mean, he used to kick kick my ass every day. He was like maybe twenty eight. You know, he's uh-huh. still in the gym every day. So I go in there, you know, learn some wrestling. Then uh, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to Lincoln. You know, I want to get back on the mat and everything. So I went to Lincoln. That's where I met EJ. Okay. Okay. EJ went to Lincoln, competed in that program. And, like, my first real experience uh, to MMA, so. Shout out to HBCUs, man. So that was Lincoln University in Jeff City. You were at? No, no, I was at Lincoln College. It was a, it's a, it was a junior college. Oh, okay, 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 okay. No, no, it was a junior college. That's what me. It's in Illinois. So it's about 
30 miles from Springfield. Oh, okay. Okay, I know. I, I, I think you know what you're talking about. Okay, cool. So let me tell you my first experience with jujitsu. Okay, so we're talking about 2002. So it was, it was the second year I was training with the guy, Fajam. I started getting good. I did some open college tournaments and everything. And um, I worked at Bally's Total Fitness in the juice bar. And this guy comes in. It's, it's going to be crazy when you when you when I tell you who this guy is, right? Uh, this guy comes in, um, and this guy's real famous promoter now. But he comes into Bally's, and he was like, uh, "Hey, you know, you do some do some wrestling." I was like, "Yeah." I was like, uh, "He's like, yeah, we do uh, jujitsu." I was like, "I said, what's jujitsu?" Right, right. And, um, yeah, it's like. I oh, too. Like, yeah, shoot. Oh, nobody, nobody knew about it then. Nobody. This, I mean, 98 is when it got blown up a little bit. Hey, so check this out. This is where it's going to get crazy. This guy's name is Mike Kogan. All right. Kogan. Mike Kogan is like, I think he lives out in California now, but at the time, he was Hoyt's Gracie's manager. He was his literal manager. And there was this swole Jack Black dude wow. named Snake. Swole. When I say swole, I mean like, even right now, he's probably damn near. His name is Snake. Uh, he owns uh, Harrisburg Jiu Jitsu out in North Carolina. But uh, uh, he, he has like a couple fighters in the UFC too. Like guys like Rodney Wallace came out of there from Sa he from Salisbury, uh, North Carolina. He had just a lot, a lot, a lot of guys come come uh, from there. But anyways, this is 2002, so I go in there and uh, they give me this. Uh, they give me this gi. Uh, I was like, man, what is this? I'm not putting this on or whatever. I went right. out there um, and I didn't know what I was doing. I said, so what are we doing here? And he's like, yeah, we're just going. At now, mind you, by the time, okay, I showed up and this was in a time where I think there wasn't any like major ranked belts or anything like that. And it, we were sharing a school with an Aikido school. So check this out. So nothing against the Aikido, but it's just, I don't know, in some instances, you know, some of the practicality. Um, it, it isn't applicable. It's like, throw, base, yeah, trust me, I, no diss, I understand. So, so that's what's going on now. Now, I'm like, man, I'm not doing that. I was like, I hope, I, I was like, because I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking double leg. I'm like, there's no way. I was like, I don't know nothing, but I know that's not going to work on me. You know, right. that's how I felt when I was watching the keto, but I didn't say anything. Because this guy had invited me. This was like my second or third uh, experience in like, oh, uh, no, it was my second experience into like a martial arts uh, uh, platform. So, um, yeah, so uh, from there, so, so where were we? Okay. So I'm going there. I do some grappling. And I'm doing good with the guys because at this time, no one is blue belt. I didn't know anything, but yeah. you know, it was hard. I didn't know what was going on. So somebody caught me in an arm bar. Oh. And I, up, and I didn't tap. And I got my arm popped. I was like, what the fuck is this? I mean, what, what is this, right? So right, like, right. And I was like, okay, well, I was like, I was like, yo, that hurt. Because he said, if I feel pain, I, was, I said, yo, that hurt. And my arm popped out. I said, that hurt. And he's like, yeah, that's a submission. I was like, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm telling you, that hurt. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, I didn't know nothing about no submissions. I ain't no shit, right? So I'm just yeah. like, yeah, that just hurt. And uh, you know, he just pretty much, uh, he just pretty much told me, he's like, yeah, that's the art. We do this, we do that. Then at that time, um, I saw a, uh, a UFC tape. So there was a store. Now this is now, now you got to be thirty plus to remember this store. It's called it was called Media Play. Do you right. remember that store? No, nah, man. Nah. They're like a a southern chain, but now mind you, it's like I want to say summertime because I'm working at uh Bally's. So there's a store called Media Play where it just had like CDs, cassette tapes, and VHSs. Yeah, DVDs, what now? So I would right. go in. So what I would do is I would go in there, I would get um, so they cost $5.99. So what I was doing when I got paid every two weeks. I will go every every two weeks. I will go and get like three or four tapes. So you're looking at six to eight tapes a month. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I had like a library of martial arts, um, 
uh, Marshall. So I actually saw Choke like right when it first came out. Right? Oh snap! So you saw the Hicks and Joint? Wow. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't that. Um, I, I didn't. I still didn't believe in it though. You know what I mean? Because I was just like, okay, it's fun to do. There was no places to wrestle, so I would stop in there, and uh, I was stopping there and just you know observe and everything like that. So um, you know. I was doing boxing too. I had been doing boxing for like four or five years up until this point. I, I just like the training for it, right? Um, yeah. So uh, I went to Lincoln. Uh, and my first experience, my first experience was uh, actually seeing an MMA dude because I, I had watched it, you know, long, you know, fast forward some years. Now, Matt Hughes went to Lincoln, okay? So he lived in Hillsboro, Illinois. And when he was at his top, he would come in, right? He would come in and beat the shit out of him. The only person he had trouble with was EJ. He still whooped EJ ass, yeah. but uh, EJ gave him some trouble because he had, like, really, really good defense. But anyways, yeah. um, uh, oh, so I get put in this front headlock from uh, Matt Hughes, and he, he almost put me out. Now, I come to find out that same choke, that he was choking the fuck out of me with in wrestling practice. And I just like, damn, he felt so strong. His front head lock felt like he was going to kill me, right? That same choke, he went out there. I, it was either before or after he fired a Hoyler, and he choked Almeida out with that damn choke. That's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy, yeah. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh, okay, I've been under that. I know what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> so, I you, like, jujitsu was in the wind. So the second year at Lincoln, this is uh, so that was the second year. So at this time, we got this, we got this guy, our our wrestling coach, one of our assistant coaches. His name was Matt Veach. Matt uh -huh. Veach is one of the craziest dudes you ever meet. He actually, um, I want to say he, you know, he fought a. Uh, so it was Matt Veach. My teammate was Sal Woods. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That was my teammate. So EJ was on that same team. That's my guy. Shout out to EJ, of course. That's my man. And yeah. he just got married, man. Uh, Congrats, EJ, no doubt. So uh, it was EJ. Gosh, it was a lot of a lot of MMA guys on that team. Um, but yeah, so those are two two notable ones, right? So yeah. uh, you know, Sal fought uh T Woodley. Um, you know, I, I you know. It didn't go the way he wanted it to go. But. <laughs> shout out to T. Wood, man. That's a hey, he represented St. Louis, so I gotta say, I gotta say, shout out to my boy, man. He was up at the school with me training, so that's that's my guy too. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So um, it was crazy because it's crazy how um, so yeah. So fast forward, um, moved to Missouri, wrestled wrestled there, and. My senior year uh, had an injury, so I spent more time in um, St. Charles MMA. EJ was training there because he was he was I think I want to say he was teaching there because he had just came out of school. He was teaching there. Um, Willie was there training. I think he he had transit just transitioned out because I remember I got a couple workouts with him before he transitioned out to to do his own thing. Um, I believe he went to like AKA or, or anything like yeah. that, but. You know, just then, you know, shit. That, I mean, me and you were there together. You had like Sam Poe, UFC, out UFC, and all these guys. And this was so early on, like I believe, like the first, maybe the first Ultimate Fighter was was out at the time, and yeah. you know, just all of these things. Right? You had um, God, what, what was the other guy's name? Fought one. Dude, we, we we still got we still got a uh, a couple. Names that just like it don't even seem real when you just start looking at like man I went against we got Ellenberger he used to yep. come down and train all the time talking about yeah and then you got uh um um oh my god he's in the uh, he fights UFC now and he is he used to train oh my gosh this is my buddy he, he would. It's the light skinned kid with the fro down at AKA, right? Tall, uh, late guy. I, it's I, a, I, a couple cats. So, anyway, long, so the dude with the fro you're talking about, he is at AKA, and that's Louise Pena. 
Pena, and he's he's doing his thing too, man. And so, uh, but there's another guy I was thinking about outside of him, and his name just I'll have it by the end of the show. It don't matter. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> it's all right. Um, and I, I can honestly say this, right? Um, they're the highest. If you if you did anything MMA. Mike Rogers would have had his hands on you at some point. Now, what people don't know about Mike Rogers is um, didn't he fight uh, God, Severn? <laughs> or, or they want it was a story behind it because they wanted him to take a fall or something. Was, what was it? And he wouldn't do it. What, what yeah, man. It? I don't know the story, but long story short, Mike fought professional and he had. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know that story. I don't know that. If, but I heard there was something going on where they wanted him to take that L and he wasn't doing it. And I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was that story. I just know, I don't know, because I can't, I can't speak on it. So I don't have the facts on that. You know what I'm saying? Well, I can tell you the facts that I do have. At that point, he was a All-American, a two-time All-American from SIU. We in a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Rodrigo Vaghi. Yeah. Which which is a legend in the sport. He's a, the direct lineage. So with that combination in those years, I could see it being very challenging to get a fight, you know, uh, uh, with, with, with Mike. Exactly. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. Fast forward. Yeah. Like I said, if, if you did any sort of, uh, martial arts or any type of competitive martial arts, you know, you would have, uh, been through, uh, you know, St. Charles and man, I, and hell, I think that's a beautiful thing because you have guys like yourself who just like training and you're in here and, and not knowingly, hey, this is the next guy. This is the this next is guy. The- <laughs> <laughs> this is that- yeah. Right. This is the next dude. It, it, it blows my mind to think about it, man. Like, I sit back and I'll be like, this can't be real, man. I just was tr- working out with this cat. This dude on TV now, whooping that. Like, it, like, it's it's amazing, man. When I when I see you now, tell tell people too. Tell my listeners, uh, <coughs> you what 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 was the next phase? So you started doing your training thing on the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu side. What do you where did you go? And then you went to the next level when you moved away from the local area. And you started training more at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. What happened next? So so my mom is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and see here's the deal. Uh, <laughs> When certain things happen, as far as you know, school ends. You have to do what's called get a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, got a job and got to um, grow up. Yeah, you got to grow up. And I was still training occasionally, but not not as much as I wanted. So I worked uh, in sales in O'Fallon at Verizon, Verizon Wireless. So the story behind that, which is um, and this and this has everything to do with this, and I'll tell you why. Right, so. In wrestling or in any type of competitive combat thing, like so in wrestling, um, you may only one person can go out to rep- represent the weight class, right? And yeah. you you may be number one guy, you may be number two, you may be number three, but you're always trying to be the best, always trying to take that spot and get your shine. And you'll see plenty of situations where seniors who've been, you know, three year starters. A freshman comes and beats them out. It's the most purest interaction because you challenge for the spot. So it's like, hey, I want to wrestle at that weight class. So you wrestle off. Loser has to sit. It is what it is. Right. 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 This thing, you know, like football, basketball or whatever, um, football, basketball, whatever, the coach determines. You're not like it's not like you're saying, hey, let's play one on one. Let's do this. It's an uh, outside source. So fast forward that back to my Verizon job. I had no sales experience. I was a, a freaking uh, exercise science major. And I went to a job fair. that just happened to be on campus. I saw the potential and how much they could make. And I was like, well, shit, I want to do this. Yeah. The recruit here. I want to do this because I can make some money. And the money will be based off of my own personal effort, right? Right. So and now, that, and now remember that is extremely important. You know, money based off my own personal effort, like that concept, right? So, uh, so from there, I uh, you know worked a job and sixty days in the training idea. Like, well, let's go to the interview, right? Black guy, he was, he was an alpha. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> he, 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 was like, he was an alpha. He was an alpha, but he, 
super cool dude. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> He, he was he was he was a little kind of a stern guy though. So I go in there and uh so check this out, dog. I was poor, very, very poor. I didn't have a suit. I got some dress pants from Goodwill, right? And my first meeting was with the um the uh manager, store manager. His name was Brian Brian Pickrell. Okay. Right. So what the, the best I could get, I went to Walmart. I want to say like EJ gave me like ten dollars to get my shirt, but anyways, um, I got a black V neck because I was in shape, and I wore some slacks so it would at least look halfway put together. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like cheap, you know. But no, I, I mean I didn't have any money, right? So went in there, took the shirt in. I, at that point, I was like what two fifteen, two twenty. You remember? I was, I was yeah, cheap. yeah. Um, go in. Have a great interview with uh, with uh, Brian Pickrell, and now the, the interview was so the interview was like the competition to me, right? Because here's the deal: no matter how many losses you take, no matter what happens, no matter who's won the most on the season, when you get to wrestle off for that position, it's who has it right now. Who has so, it? Right? Yeah. right. So in my mind, I had no sales experience. You had other people who had sales experience, right? Um, but for me, I was like, hey. This is the match. Yeah, I got for me. I got the interview. Right, right. There was a process to get the interview, but that's another story. But anyway, get the interview, make it to uh, but his name was Batarius Peterson. We wound up being uh, actually cool friends, but had the interview. Interview with well, he didn't even want to meet with me. Dog, no, he said. Uh, he said to uh, the manager, he says he doesn't even have a suit on. Oh <laughs> man! <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, I was like, ah, okay. But Brian- so, hold on, hold on. This is a, this is an opportunity, y'all, to see true perseverance, man. So, like, my show is about perseverance because if you recognize on Enter the Last Dragon, the people that I base my show around, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee Roy, both of them individuals went through some type of transition on each one of the films that I really care about, Enter the Dragon and The Last Dragon. There was a transition where they had to persevere through something on each one of their films, especially you can look back on all Bruce Lee films. Chinese connection, they persevered through something, something where they got out of. This brother basically said, I don't have any money, but I'm going to figure out a way. You use some ingenuity and you persevered. You said, hey, I'm going to go to Goodwill. I'm going to go get me a shirt. I'm going to go be the best person I could be and I'm going to show up and show up and show up me and give you me. And now keep going with your story, man. Paint the picture. Keep going. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I go there and I'm like, uh, I was sitting out there for a while, and now mind you, my manager didn't tell me this until after, after the after I got hired or whatever. And, and he said, "A Batarius was like, uh, he didn't even have a suit on. I'm not interviewing this guy, and he has no experience. Wow. But because I had did my job in the first interview, I practiced. I looked up the company. I looked up sales. I asked the right questions because I didn't know shit about sales. I just knew that. Hey, listen." I don't have any like to the blizz. I'm gonna tell you what I what I mean when I say I didn't have any money. My mom couldn't even make it to my graduation. Yeah, you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. My mom couldn't even make it to my graduation, so um, it was like that, right? And right. I, I didn't even I didn't even know how I was gonna get back home. I graduated. As a matter of fact, let me rewind a little bit. What pushed me into this job because what was happening was I couldn't get I couldn't get no one to take my call, so I would just calling every day every week because i was in summer school now mind you, i have one week because i got injured i got injured um i got injured in the season so i lost my scholarship at the end of the season i lost my scholarship um uh, because i got injured and from there from there i had to do summer school right yeah. because i didn't have enough courses so I owed all of this. I wound up owing a lot of money after school, but you know that's nothing. But anyways, the time is coming for us to move because all three sessions. The reason why I was doing all three sessions is because I needed to find a way to make some money so I can get home. You know, what I'm saying because right. I didn't have financial help there, so I was, you know, my, you know, I was working, work and learn. So <laughs> Linda would have like a messed up program, but I, it's it's good, you know. So we were doing construction work. Uh-huh. 
in the day. So I did grounds. Wow. I did grounds so I was getting up at 6 a.m. doing grounds in summer school, then having to go to class, go back out and do grounds. Wow, so, man. So that I, listen, so that I could um, go out back out to do grounds so that I could um, uh, stay in school and I, you know, and I have to worry about these bills so I can eat and everything else like that, right? Right. So that's that's where I was at. So mind you, I was like, yo, I got to get a job. And, and I tried to I tried to align it to where, okay, we got to be out of these summer school houses on blank day. The process for a job is this. So I was making it. I was neck and neck. I was neck and neck. And when you hear the rest of it, it's going to drive you crazy. So I was neck and neck with the timeline, right? So what wound up happening was I had to be out of school, but I was still trying to get this job at Verizon, right? So what wound up happening is I was out of school. Um, I was out of school and I was uh Terry Russell. I always remember this guy. I asked if I could stay a little longer, but he charged me for it, right? The school charged me for it. I was like, hey, I couldn't get home. But what wound up happening was um I had did like some little odd jobs. I was doing whatever. And I got me a car, you know, for like eleven hundred a beater. <laughs> And what I was doing was um, got the job at Verizon and, um, you know, back to the interview. I had the interview, got the job, got the job at Verizon, started work. Now, my training was in Wentzville. And all I had was $100. Oh, bro, you can't do that. Oh, listen, two weeks. So I slept in my car. Okay, I slept in my car. I would go work out in Lindenwood, take a shower. You know what I'm saying? I had to go back to Goodwill because of suit and tie. So I had like a sh- two shirts and two pants, and I would alternate them to switch them up. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, dude, why- that's a that's a that's a that's an amazing story. So you you literally went from I got to figure this out. You figured it out, got the job. Literally, uh, what's the name of that movie? Uh, where not the Blind Side with Will Smith and the dude with the stock market thing. He was living in the car. You was kind of like that. Golly, man. Let me tell you something. I wasn't nothing like that because I don't have that seven million he made yet. Oh, uh, <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> dude caked up, right? You know what I'm saying? He made dough, right, right. Right. No, uh, but uh, yeah. So yeah, staying in the car, and I was I was mad because I kept getting these obstacles. So. Check this out. I was in Wentzville. So, people... Now, mind you, Zach Cummings... I, ha- I had wrestled Zach Cummings in regionals. Zach Cummings was in the UFC. He was working with... We were in training together. That's right? crazy. Yeah. Right? So, he was doing the customer service side. So, Zach, that's my man. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so we were doing training together. And we... Oh, I remember doing... We, we just talked and we were working in training. Now, there was a so how do you how old are you at this time? Because at this time you don't realize it, but you've actually at least interacted with five UFC at the minimum and ten professional fighters. At the at the, how old are you at this time? Beginning and you're just the beginning, just leaving college. Uh, so I took some time off. So I like twenty. I don't know, 27, 28, something like that. So by this time, not even realizing the the people you've already touched at this time. That's crazy. Tell where you about to tell my my listeners where we where we going to with all this. What tell us what you're doing. Keep going. Keep going with just build it up, man. Paint the story. Paint the picture. Okay, yeah. So uh, so back to that. So um so yeah. So um okay, so where was I? okay, yeah. So in my car, get the job. And and this was the the, uh, the the other obstacle. The other obstacle was this. If I was 40, the address I put was 42 miles away, right? Wow. If I was 45 miles, they would have put me in a hotel room, right? So, you know, because Zach, he was coming from, like, uh, southern Missouri. So they would be, give him a per diem. They would give him a per diem for food, like $100 a day, had him in a hotel room the whole week. Right. I didn't get no per diem. I didn't get shit. Cause I was three miles short. That's crazy. All right, so so 
persevered, got through it, and uh, wound up getting the job. So long story short, sixty days in, we have we had a. Uh, <clears throat> It was December at this time, so 60 days in the end of me actually working. I was this is when 4G had just launched. I was the 4G G rep of the year. Wow. Right, you know, 60 days on the job. You know what I mean? 60 days on the job. So I wanted to get closer home. I had some some home things, wanted to help out a little more there. Um, wanted to get closer to home. So I got a transfer to Shelby. Right. So I was play, I was training with my homeboy uh Brandon. Uh, Brandon Beach, he was doing MMA at the time. And what I was doing was I was uh, going to Charlotte to that same school genre. By this time, Mike is long gone because we're talking about a decade and a half later. But uh, I was just training. I was hitting these Nagas up, uh, was crushing the Nagas. And honestly, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I, I, I wasn't really learning anything, so to speak, right? Um, right. But but it was crazy because let me tell you what was going on, you know, because at that time there was this saying because in the jujitsu world, the school name Alliance was on top of the jujitsu world, 10, 11, All day. 12, right? So what they were doing at the school that I, were, I was at, great guys there, great people, but, but the problem was we were not learning effective technique. One, because of... Uh, I think the level of the instructors at the time. All right. Um, and now that what school was that? What school was that one? It was like a. I hate to say this because I I really like the guy. He's like a really close friend, but it's like a. Well, no, I don't like, say it. Keep it. Keep it as is. You ain't gotta. You know what I'm saying? Don't put him out there. I, no, I'm not gonna say his name, but it was like a school. I was gonna describe a scenario. It was a school to where uh, you get. Whatever professor is gonna, you know, sponsor you and back you, so to speak. Um, so that's what I was meaning. I got so, you. One of those schools. But what we would do is, we were part of uh, the, the Roberto Traven Alliance. Um, we were under him, but he was with the Alliance at the time before he split off. So we would go down here to the camp, and I remember like these world champion level guys, at Alliance. I learned how to do quote unquote anti jujitsu uh by going down there and they got these world level guys and they we they just throwing us in their guard because at that time the integration of wrestling and jujitsu didn't exist. It's like you either right. wrestling or jujitsu. Yeah. It was like really late, right? And you know people didn't embrace both arts the way that they do now. Right. So they were just because of the physical dimensions. So at this time Dorino was on top of the world and uh, he went against Rodney Wallace in a jiu-jitsu match at a Naga tournament. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. uh, I can't remember exactly. I know it was like an OO match, and they gave it to Dorino, but everybody felt like there was some screwage go uh, going on there. You know what I'm saying? This big yoked up black dude who got some wrestling breakdown, who fought in the UFC. Didn't know that much jujitsu, but he could sit there, right? So at that point, wrestlers were integrating training. They weren't embracing the jujitsu sport, so to speak, but they were using like you know, uh, they were they were, they were building up a, an intuition of what's going on by sitting in the guards, being in different things. In different um, positions. When you get in those positions and repetitive, your body start muscle memory happens. And wrestlers know it more than anybody on muscle memory all day. Right. Yeah. So exactly. So um, so we would go down there with I didn't know these guys were the best. We we're going out with the best of the best, and we just you know, they just store us in the guard and we just knew how to <laughs> you know. Yeah, fend them off. Right, right. All day. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna start competing. So I started like crushing like higher level people and all this other stuff. So I was like, oh man, okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna go down to this was the first year the uh Atlanta Open IBJJF happened. Went down there, won the open, um was competing in a uh, I, I won my class, my weight class, and I was going into the open division. So for people who don't understand, once you win your weight class in IBJJF, then you Excuse me. Then you have um, an open division into which there's no weight class. Everybody that plays in the top three, they throw them in a bracket. 
and it's whoever you whoever you get is who you get. Right. 300 pound, 100, 150 pounds, hey, you win at the division. So it is what it is. So one of my first two matches and I got like poked in the eye, I was like, man, there was a stigma though, because it was it was it was kind of like um in those days, I don't want to say like there was any like racial tension, but it was a it was a there was a segregation because it was like, okay, well, you knew like these people from this school knew blank, right? These people from this school know blank. And I was like, hey man, why don't none of the black guys know nothing? But there were some black guys down there that did. Right. And, and that was uh, Team Lloyd Irvin had came down. I was like, man, I was like, well, you know, I'm like, who's the instructor, all of this other stuff. And um, it, w- it was Master Lloyd, obviously, but I thought there was like, okay, some Brazilian guy, you know, came through and helped him out and taught, taught him the moves and all this other stuff. And it was like, man, he was just crushing. So now, mind you, at this time, I'm working in Salisbury, business going well. I have applied for chiropractic school. And I had just recently got accepted to Palmer Chiropractic um, down in uh, Florida. And uh, so, you know, I'm going to go do this uh, medical thing, right? So he says, uh, hey, we're having trials in November, right? And I was like, oh, okay, great. And this was a jiu-jitsu thing. Now, mind you, hey, listen, this is so crazy how, you know, I believe in God, right? It's crazy right. how things work where, you know, I have this job I get laid off from. I got laid off from Verizon because um, I was doing too good of a job uh, at Verizon because I was getting windfalled. Windfall means when, like, so Verizon put this thing in place to where if you make too much commission, they start taking it. You know what I mean? It starts coming back the opposite way, right? So um, they laid me off. That's and crazy. I got, now, I got approved. I got approved for uh, college. But I didn't know how I was going to do it, right? But my rent was doing all this other stuff. Went through Social Security, got denied twice. I did an appeal, got so uh, not Social Security, but unemployment, right? So I yeah. had a year. I got. I had a year to where I was going to get like two hundred and fifty dollars uh, every week, every Monday. I had to fill out. You know, you go online. <laughs> did you look? For- <laughs> uh, yes. Um, <laughs> did you- That's funny, man. It's crazy. Did you fill out at least three applications? Yes. You know, oh, just, man. You had to do it every week or you didn't get your money. So yeah. no matter where I was, I got to a community. Anyways, so lost the job. And I was like, uh, okay, I got this situation. Now, by this time, I had came up to uh, Camp Springs, made the, made the trial. Now, not only did I made, I was the MVP of the uh, the comp team tryout. I was the MVP of it, right? Uh, and that came for the person who worked hard and just said, fuck it. But I tell you this story, right? There was at this one point in it because the trial was like very, very long and tedious. It was to the point, uh, at this time, it was this guy named Keenan Cornelius there. And he was, um, he just got his brown belt. No, yeah, he just got his brown belt because they, they were filming the BJJ Kumite at this time, right? Uh-huh. Keenan had just got his brown belt. I was like, man. I really hope he chokes me out so I can get a breather. So, like, he locked up this choke on me, and I was, I ain't tapped, and he let me go. I was like, fuck. You know what I mean? But we wind up being cool when it just happened to be Kenny, because I didn't know anything about the world of jujitsu whatsoever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, I just knew I liked doing it, right? And I was like, yeah. oh, no, I like doing it. So, um, past the trial, so now I have a, a dichotomy here, right? I have to make a decision. I got medical school. I got this opportunity. And I said, you know what? The school not burning down. <laughs> <laughs> I said, fuck it, let's see what happens with this jujitsu thing. That's right, man. Hey, you live once, man. You live only once, brother. That's uh, it. Right. Now, 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 now that, that was perceived as like one of the dumbest decisions you know that i could have uh <laughs> could have done and uh but, but it you, was, can't, you, you won't have no regrets though no regrets man imagine imagine you saying i go down this road and i regret on what could be you know what i'm saying you can go back to school later in life boss you know what i'm saying check this out though it's, it, it's funny that you say that because now you got you got a decision and it wasn't so the decision wasn't that because the decision wasn't that simple 
Now, if you remember the story of my timeline, listen, no shirt, no clothes, right? Right. No place to stay, sleeping in a in a, in a thing, right? Making in these times sixty five, seventy thousand dollars fresh out of college, right? Uh, right. With sales, right? Sixty five, seventy thousand dollars, and I'm saying fuck all that. I'm excuse me, forget all that. Forget the school where where it's paid for. I'm gonna go down this path. Remember, I came from nothing. I had just got my life together. <laughs> just the first six months of having a job, having financial freedom, having a place to stay. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was like, ah, forget that. So that, that was a real decision because you got people who say, hey, I'm the, I'm the first, other than my mom, I'm the, I'm the only person that gra- graduated from college. Exactly. First generation. First gen. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm like, yo, out of my grandma's kids, I'm the only one. So I'm like, yo, I'm saying screw all that that I work for. None of that. Throw all of that out and I'm going to go roll around. So how did it work? How did it work for you, man? Tell us about it. Well, see, the good, the, 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 the positive thing to that is because I didn't have any help, I did everything myself. So outside of people just giving their opinion, they weren't doing anything anyway. So it's not like they could snatch anything from me. Right, 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 right. Uh, that, that, that was the thing. I had this little 250, so I came up, made the trial, came up here. Um, so at, the, at that time, there was three fighter houses, okay? The Jungle. And this is at, this is at Lloyd School. You're at Lloyd School now. Lloyd School at this point. So uh-huh. this, this is the Jungle. The gutter is where I lived, all right? The gutter, and then you had um, Mystic Ave, right? So I had no idea about no jujitsu, who this was. I just like, hey, I like this. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to be like those dudes I saw in Atlanta, right? So I got immersed in this world, and then, like, you know, got some training in, but, man, it was like, man, training was so freaking rough. I mean, it was the first, the reason why this program was so successful because it's the first time that, you know, a, biz, uh, a business expert, marketing expert for Fortune 500 company on one side does a uh, corporate 500 model for a jiu-jitsu school, first time it's ever been done, right? Yep, right, right. Corporate 500 model in a jiu-jitsu school. But then on the opposite side of that, you have almost a decade of notes of top-level athletes in grappling, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you have all of these notes, and you have all of these blueprints and all of these things. You've run all of these programs, not programs, ran all these analytics. When I say ran all these Linux, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to send this to Master Lloyd. I'm going to link this to him. But um, when you talk about analytics here, man, we're talking about. Shout out, not- shout out, Master Lloyd. So this is our frat brother as well. Shout out to the Q's members of Omega South 5 Fraternity Incorporated. Master Lloyd was one of these brothers that I met personally as well, who, who you sit down with him, you're guaranteed to learn something. Just being in his presence, you're going to learn. Have a conversation, you're going to learn. He is the truth. Uh, he was the first one of the first guys. He got I, – I, I connected with him online, um, him and Roddy Ferguson. And this is just keeping it 100 from the videos and the email stuff that marketing they were doing. They were doing this stuff times 10 before anybody when it came to – putting this information out for the world to consume. They knew they stuff, and they still know they stuff. Amazing brothers, Roddy Ferguson on the judo side, uh, Lloyd Irvin on that, on that, on that Brazilian jiu-jitsu side, and just Brazilian school side, Brazilian business school side, Brazilian fighter side, UFC, all the above. This dude is amazing. One of the dopest things he said, he, he, I took from him for one of his videos was like having multiple streams of income. I was like, dang, what this brother talking about? And he literally said, which was so amazing, he was like, 
imagine yourself as a stool. If you got four legs as a stool of income and you lose one of those income streams, imagine if it was your regular job, you still got three other legs that can hold that stool up, even though it's not as strong. I said, man, this brother is just off the chain. He just took me to a whole nother level. So keep going. Keep going with your story, man. I had to throw that shout out right there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, now I was, I was actually just texting them. Uh, so, yeah, so on the opposite side, he takes the highest level of training. Now, understand, he had um, some athletic aspirations, right? He went to Bowie State, okay? The ECIG, bro, went to Bowie State. And I, I want to say he got looked out by the Browns. He had, you know, six foot three, um, 198, 200 pounds. Freaking four, four, three, forty play safety, but unfortunately, te- he he didn't have it technically, right? He didn't have like the technical uh, things, right? But what he took from that was the uh, the way a athletic corporation is ran, right? Having that exposure to NFL, NFL is is top tier food chain as far with as far as evaluating athletes um then you have like the olympic uh training center he was out there at the olympic training center uh doing mm-hmm. the testing then he has actually two cycles olympic cycles with Radi to where he tested and he had it proven theories that um in a very short amount of time uh on both sides you you have a uh you make a you make a like like because of him right now um not only we're not even talking about jujitsu, we're just talking about fitness companies. He's he was the 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 leading guy for making it making making a gym a viable way to 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 make a living. All day, I can I believe that hundred percent. You hadn't seen you didn't see any gyms, no fitness enthusiasts with these these ads. You saw none of that because. Gyms were for other gym people. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the way it was being marketed. Uh, but at any rate, on the opposite side of that, um, on the jiu-jitsu side, so he has all of these notes. And when I say all of these notes, uh, floppy disks full of stuff. You know what I mean? Floppy disks, um, uh, 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 a catalog paper. of information, just so much information. Written like like we're not. I guess I, I'm trying to uh, convey how how detailed and thorough it is. It's not like getting a bunch of websites together typing things up. These are written, handwritten notes. All right, these are uh, manus- manuscripts, so to speak. Right? Yeah, yeah. Talking about he he you know in class and he would talk about like when you talk about judo level like like judo levels. Right? You have the gold medal level silver medal level, bronze medal level, and everybody else in between. And he was just talking about technique proficiency of all four of those levels because he documented it over the years and he studied it, you know. So um you know so 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 that's where he he completely revolutionized like the grappling industry, not even from the competitive aspect. Now when you're talking about uh training, right? Training. Um, first in, at MMA, MMA school I know of where people have gone from start to finish start to finish right so you look at um, most MMA gyms they get athletes with a skill set already True. whether it be wrestling striking oh listen he took regular Joe Schmo off the streets that's coming in just to lose some weight and turn them into world level athletes. Right. So, you know, competing, you know, uh, we've had world champions. Um, we've had black. Now we have black belt world champions, home, a homegrown American based black belt world champion. You look at every other black belt, every other black belt that's done it. That's an American. I'm talking about IBJJF. Um, Every and, we, and IBJJF is the premier, FYI listeners who don't know, IBJJF is the premier when it comes to any tournament that's held 
inside the U.S. or outside of the U.S., Brazil primarily, as well as overseas in Europe, everywhere you could think of, IBJJF is the premier and is the one that everyone knows is the, the height of, of everything. It's the height. So that's what he's referencing. So, um, so when he says homegrown, right, homegrown, he says that he prides himself and that he should. So what that means is every other black belt that's ever won from, as of America, you have BJ Penn, I believe Rafael Lovato, and obviously I'm leaving some, some people out. There was some Brazilian influence in their upbringing and training. Right? right now, right. Leo Leo Dollar is Master Lloyd's uh, instructor. That's that's right. But Jamil, Master Lloyd created him from a I believe four, like fourteen. He could have been younger, but a teenager. Wow. Never been to other school. Never been to a Brazilian guy. Never nothing. Right. First American made. You know how many black belts. There are that are Americans that get their uh, that get their 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 belts from a Brazilian instructor. It's, it's tradition, yeah. So there's no American instructors that say, "Hey, you're my student," and without any other influence, be able to teach them. It's one thing to learn jujitsu, but it's another thing to compete at on, on a professional level at jujitsu. No doubt. You know what I mean? So it's like he's the first one to do that, and and, and a lot of that comes from work ethic, notes, and all that other stuff. So you know, um, so to parallel that to marketing, like other businesses, and and me personally, so we had a exodus to where we had a lot of people leave. It was just a, a situation that took place. So there were a lot of empty empty positions, and at the school because you know half of the team left, and um, I remember uh, I came here. I was just I was just a guy trying to learn jujitsu, and um, popped in. I was training, and uh, one day Mike Easton asked me a question about a double leg. I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I can show you. Yeah, I'll show you how to do it." So uh, Master Lloyd hadn't come in yet, so I show him Mike, and uh, when he came in, uh, you know, he rolled by and I didn't see him, and he sat down and he was just watching me talk to Mike about. You know, just wrestling, explain the angles and how to finish the takedown. He's like, hey, you know how to teach wrestling. Why didn't you tell me that? I was like, I didn't know it mattered. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah. I was like, I, I didn't know it mattered. And he's like, okay. So he was like, okay, um, well, I want you to teach a wrestling class. And I said, what? I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yes, yeah, so I was just like, I right, bet because at this time now remind you, I'm back, I'm back in the slums because everybody left. That um the living situations had changed. So you have three houses now in California. I was like, man, I need to so now that I'm here, because I thought I was on like a red shirt program, because you know there's a lot of people. You know, when you come here, you got to get it acclimated to the environment, the systems, the programs, and that takes a while. Yeah. And uh, I was I was cool in the red 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 shirt slot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was a red shirt. Um, so uh, yeah, so I started teaching a wrestling class, which was um, done in the morning, right? And the wrestling class was going good. People were doing it at this time. Uh, Sajar Eubanks. She was a brown, but this is just my roommate. We got we call ourselves evil evil twin because we got the same birthday. Now, right now, she's number two in the world. Uh in the UFC, the wow. female division. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. number two in the world. Yeah, so she's gonna be vying for that title very soon. But anyways, um, so I and I I don't know any of this, man. I'm just I'm just here training. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And um, we wind up moving in together at Mystic Ave. So it was just me and her. And um you know, so got involved. I was working at the school, teaching wrestling. So, unfortunately, like, training myself kind of took the back burner because, you know, um, I had to do the business part of the school. I was doing sales, front desk, and all of the marketing. So, the way he had it set up for me, I was like my own sales rep. So, he gave me... Uh, so, you got opportunity to basically 
put yourself in a position where you lost from the uh, the Verizon, the unemployment, going to college to start a new career on this UFC Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school side. Even that it wasn't even I wasn't even thinking about. It. All I wanted to do was train. And because I needed to pay, like I had to pay, like I had some bills I needed to pay. Unemployment had ran out, right? Right. So um, got a job at the front desk. And I was just like, any money. I didn't know nothing about the marketing. I, I didn't care, right? Uh, I was there to train, right? And so got involved and I was living at the house uh, and I was working the, the desk. Uh, I was working the desk, the uh, front desk or whatever. Working the front desk. And um, doing the marketing, he's like, hey, you want to do sales? I'm like, yeah. So it was crazy. You would think that, you know, we had to do this like sales training on one night, take a test, pass the test. But you would think that, okay, you do the lease, you know, you dealt with leads coming in, inbound leads, outbound leads. You did. You did deal with that. But I told him I needed some more money. And he's not going to give you no money. He's like, hey, listen, I give you an opportunity. And right. I was just. I was just looking at it as that, right? So, you can I grab this real quick? I want to show yeah, it to you. Yeah. All right. All right. So, he gave me this. Uh, this little thing. So. Ah, oh, nice, man. So, let me tell you this. At the time, People look at it and say, man, that, that thing looks like a POS, right? Yeah. It's a old DVD series or whatever, right? So at the time, this was a doggone two, three, four, five thousand dollar product. You know what I'm saying? So he gave it to me. I learned it. And um so check this out. It was this was the most interesting thing I've ever seen in my life. He gave me a website, right? He gave me this technology called Get Response, and he told me to learn how to write autoresponders. No help. He just said, hey, this was for my marketing. He, uh, he had one opt-in box for me, but you have a website, and you have to do the full sales cycle. So that, that product right there is a Google AdWords product. So I, you know that thing shows you analytics, how to you know drive traffic to your website, which he gave me. And what I had to do is I had to set appointments with my customers. I had to, you know, be there for the appointment and go through the sale, full sales cycle and signing the contracts to all that stuff. That's cool, man. That's cool. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. And um, so I did that. And um, mostly, you know, it, you know, in, in class, right, uh, jiu-jitsu class, he would talk about like, uh, mindset stuff, you know, you, you may hear about li limited belief or, you know, things like this. I, I never forget this one. This one, this one, he would say, he would say things like, um, when he would talk about, he'd give examples. Like, so I remember this example. Like, if you grow up and someone says, every time it says, you, you say, hey, mom, I want some Jordans. And they said, no, you can't have any Jordans. We can't afford that. And every time you ask for something like that, no, we can't afford that. 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 When you can afford it, you have a limited belief theory to where you won't get it or enjoy it. And, and mentally, you still think you can't afford it. Right. So he used, he used that analogy for like, you know, different techniques. And, and what that could mean to me is like, hey, listen. You know, he has this 10,000 rep philosophy. You get 10,000 rep in a position. It doesn't matter who the who the competitor is. If you trap them in your game, you can beat them. It doesn't matter how good they are, what it is. If you can get them there, you can beat them. 10,000 reps can be done in two months. So now it will be about, do you believe? Right, right. right. Do you believe? Right now, in, in that analogy, the limited belief would be, I couldn't do this three months ago. I've done the work. I know it's there. I know I know how to do it. Now it's just about does your belief system prevent you from executing? Dude, that's a freaking nugget for my listeners, man. That's gonna be um I have to I have to start this episode with that. Repeat that again. Do you believe that is a nugget, but man, dude, that's yeah. beast mode. 
Yeah, so for me, so I was doing I was doing coaching parallel with this. So my training personally, what I actually came there for was kind of put on the back burner, you know what I mean? Because now it's like to really be good at coaching, to really be able to help somebody the way you need to, you have to be selfless. You know, you have to put all your energy into them. You're, you have to come second, right? So at this time, we got this kid named James Vick, who's a boxer primarily. He has like some shrimping capability. He's a white belt in jiu-jitsu, boxing, but he did good in the Ultimate Fighter. This is where we at. And this is the first UFC. This, I think this is the first UFC Conor McGregor was on also. Or it's close because he fought Max Holloway's when they're fighting Boston. Right? So we get a two-time national qualifier wrestler from some some, I think, Utah school. And he has a brown belt, a reputable brown belt in jiu-jitsu. And at this time, Vic has no takedown defense in boxing. And a white belt level of jiu-jitsu. Oh, so he brother. Said, hey, listen, so he says, <laughs> he says, hey, Greg, wrestling coach, this is your shot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lloyd Comedy, man, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so he said, yeah, this is your shot. And I was like, um, all right. So I was like, okay. Let me look this guy up. What I noticed was, um, so I'll tell you this, guys, and, and this is for people that train. Wrestling isn't the problem in most instances. It's the attributes and mindset from what it takes to be good at wrestling. That's the problem. Anybody can have a strong double leg. Now, now time and the technical proficiency are cool, too. But without some of the other attributes, um, you're not going to be able to apply it on anybody. Well, a high-level guy, right? So, right. like, for example, if I did jiu-jitsu, I wrestled 10 years at the whatever, right? And then you get someone that's been off the mat for two years, just the mentality alone, we, we may we may struggle with the guy, yeah. right? Because of the attribute base, right? But anyways, um, so... Uh, what, what was I? What was I, dog? I was talking well, about. Well, just, well, just because, because you know what I mean. I usually keep my my podcast to a certain time frame. I want you to really take it to where you at with now. Like, how many? Pl- what do you? What's your why? What you're doing currently on the business side, and what your who's your client? Tell me that because we gotta we gotta. I, I want my my listeners to know how you help individuals daily. Okay, well, so yeah, I, I got to that. So um, I'll tell you this, right? So I got into playing poker, right? I wanted more money. I met this professional poker player, uh, made 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 some money there. And all of the things that I learned from doing this mastermind stuff and just trying to survive at the time, right? Because yeah. I told you I wasn't thinking about it. I started saying, hey, if I apply these principles, like, you know, with the poker, the tracking it, to really understand what's going on. If I apply these same principles to this, right? then let me see how it goes. So just with the limited belief, stepping out there to play. Right. You know, just believing in it. You know, all of these things came into play. So it started there, and it gave me a platform to – um, and I was, I was playing professional poker. So it gave me the platform to, um, one, meet people. Um, two, uh, it gave me the ability to be in a position to where I could pursue the things that I needed to with no, no financial limitations or no, um, yeah. so I got into the marketing. I went to the marketing hard. I liked it, but it wasn't something that I was happy about doing every day. Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't something that I would like, Oh, I got to. You know, I, I I could be good at it sales. I was good at it because, um, yeah, I, I just trained it. Um, and out of necessity, you got to think what you do without, it's not sales, it's hustling, right? You know right, what I mean? Right, like, right, you know, yeah, yeah. I got to get, I got to get this, you know. You got to eat. You got to eat. Right, right, so you become, you become good at, at, at certain answers. But anyways, um, so I went into that. I was like, uh, no, I've always played poker, always going to play. 
But uh, as of late, I've gotten into technology. So some years back, I taught myself how to program. Okay. Taught myself how to program and um, I built some apps. I'm still playing poker. But man, I tell you, playing poker, man, it's hard to, uh, it's extremely hard to go and start at the at the bottom because the, the poker is so lucrative. And it's wow. like, get the money now. Yeah. Like, uh, just imagine, you know, you go, uh, go into a game and you walk out with anywhere from fifteen to seven thousand dollars, you know what I mean? Playing a yeah. game. Yeah, that's you know? crazy. Yeah, so it's hard to do something that matters. So whatever that thing was, I have to really, really like it. Like and, and then too, another thing about poker, you just totally mm. lose like Do you currently train? Uh no, you good. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Okay. What'd you say? All right. So, so do you do you currently train or work with anything now? I so see you've been doing your physical fitness thing yourself. Or are you doing anything yeah. oh, on the yeah. physical training your clients now? Oh yeah, absolutely, man. So, um, yeah. So I worked with um, a lot of athletes uh, coming up, like um, Tim Spriggs. I worked with him. His his brown belt campaign. He's a no gi black belt world champion. Muhammad Ali, Sylvia. He uh, he's a black belt gi world champion, which is one of the most prestigious uh, things you can have. So I did their campaigns. I uh, trained some cycles of ADCC. Um, what I'm wow. nine, I'm nine and one as a coach in the UFC. Um, yeah, nine and one as a coach in the UFC. Trained multiple fighters for that, um, and then just like throughout the wrestling training, all of those athletes that were in my in my program, you know. And not not in my program, but in my in my class at the school, um, you're talking about 14, 15 world titles. That's amazing. And UFC fighters and all, you know, because I you got to think uh, I was training Mike Easton for a lot of his fights when he fought T.J. Dillashaw. I trained him for that fight. I did my portion of it, right? So, um, and that's I, amazing, man. You you didn't even get to all this good stuff, and. <laughs> That's, that's where that's where it ended with uh, started with Vic. So Vic had this this wrestling guy who's been wrestling his whole life, national qualifier, which that's a high accolade, Division One national qualifier, brown belt jiu jitsu. And I said to myself, okay, do I teach him wrestling like what every other wrestler would teach you, or do I teach him what he needs to win based off what I saw? And what I saw was this particular wrestler. I watched some of his wrestling highlights. He's not a top guy, meaning he's not going to be the type of guy that's going to hold you down. Vic is 6'3", and he's not skinny. He's athletic. So my my whole training philosophy was I, Master Lloyd trained him a guillotine. So he did maybe six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 guillotines in this camp, just yeah. training, training, training them. For me, I was like, he's not going to be able to stop the takedown. So what we have to do is we have to work on bottom stuff. So we have to when he's on the way to taking us down, we have to beat him in the transition to beat him back up to his to our feet. We go out there, Vic Vic peppers him up a little bit with the hands. He shoots in immediately, takes him down. Beat Vic beats him to his feet, locks up the guillotine. Fifty six seconds submission. That's crazy, dude. That's crazy. That's you know crazy. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Like that 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 is like purest studying the opponent knowing where there's gaps and there's holes attacking those gaps and holes and taking it and making it your advantage not focusing on your weakness but identifying where you can make a strength that's positive man that's rock star dude so then so let me ask you this now um are you you still do the classes for the wrestling are you still working with the school in any capacity so I go, I go in and work out myself now. I just like, as of late, since I've been doing, um, like IT my, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. My business stuff. And, and mm-hmm. I get to this, like, I still send workouts uh, to the guy. Like I work with this, um, this with this one young up and coming guy. Um, his name, they call his name is Rico state and they call him the flash. So I give him like physical things to do to help him uh, get stronger, more expl- explosive and things like that. But I go in and train, like actually, uh, I was just in there, believe it or not, I was in there training with Master Lloyd. Master Lloyd's still on the mat. Oh, man, I believe it, man. That dude a beast, man. I, hey, I believe it. 
But yes, I popped in there and trained with him. Um, I, I would like to go more, but um, right now it's just um, right now it's just about building my company and uh, you know making sure all of that stuff is done correctly. So uh, how you tell us about your name of your company? What do you do? What, what service you provide? Yeah, so um, it's Howell LLC, right? And uh, what I would like to say is it's, it's kind of like a niche that um, it's here, but it's not, right? So I am, I am an anonymity expert, okay? Anonymity means like, um, you know, we're putting so much out into the digital field. And I can, I can explain this to you in uh, some easy steps. Like, okay, so if you look at artificial intelligence, um, look at it as a tree. Uh, the internet is a tree the Facebook and just different media sources are the branches and we're the leaves. Okay. So we're actively programming artificial intelligence, you know? So we're saying, Hey, listen, this is uh, like, for example, if we say, uh, uh, we do a profile. Okay. I'm a six foot three black male that lives here. I and bank at this location. I buy this, drive this type of car. I, um, uh I live in this type of neighborhood. This is a school district. This is the income, our annual income. We build all that data is what you're talking about. Absolutely. And, and see, right now it's being manipulated for marketing and, and things like that. Like if you go to a website and, and you say, okay, I want to see these most recent shoes, you go to the shoes and that damn thing follows you everywhere. So it's a basic retargeting there, right? So if I asked you, Roy, how do you get to St. Charles MMA? You would be able to direct me, right? Yeah. Okay. So here's the deal, right? What if there was a technology fast enough to access that data right instantly, just like a memory? Because understand, remember the internet, everything is on the internet. We're constantly uploading it. If there was some sort of machine fast enough to access it and upload that information at, at a second, just like a normal memory, that's uh that's big and i think that's the future they're releasing 5g uh i just recently was in a hacking lab so we we're looking at um how to do a polygraph on someone like you have an apple watch right i disable my uh i disable like my heart rate monitor on a polygraph machine what are you using to uh to uh what are they monitoring to do the polygraph the, your, your your vitals right right Balls, your vitals Pulse heart rate, right? Yeah, your vitals, yeah. On a Fitbit, right? On a Fitbit, on an Apple Watch, Samsung, any of these smart watches, you could literally right now, it exists right now to where I can hack your phone and I can give you a polygraph and you don't even know it. That's crazy. Yeah, so I can give you a polygraph and you don't even know it, right? So things like with everything we log into, um, like for instance, it gives you an option to log in with Facebook. Right. So when you log in with Facebook, that existing profile goes along with the, the rest of the information. So you're updating the information. So let's just say you like uh, suspense stories and it just so happens. OK, you're watching something on YouTube, which is linked to your Facebook and Gmail. You have this on and your heart rate is raising. You know what I mean? So you, it, it, you're essentially putting your, your whole limbic system online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Financial data, you know, all of this ransomware. So I'm projecting that very soon people are going to want to delete their digital footprint. They wanna, they're going to want to get rid of their digital footprint. They're going to want to um, have some anonymity and, and take back some of the amendments that, uh, that the Constitution gives us. So that's what how, how LLC is going to be able to provide them. Hey, Absolutely. if you want to you want to remove your digital pr footprint, you're going to be able to say boom, 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 and you have these things in place. All right, so tell tell my so I have to do this because we we coming close to an end. I always um, give this little moment in time on each one of my episodes where I give a clue, and you got an answer for me. And this one is uh, I'm gonna trip you up here, man. You said. Uh, uh, you get started being on the young age, on the movie side. So I'm gonna hit you with the films. I got to oh, do some films, bro. So name yeah. for me. You got a name for me right now. Um, three movies with 
Oh, that's too easy. That's too easy. I, I, I don't. That's too easy. That I was going. I, that's too easy. I was gonna. I was gonna. I was gonna hit you with John Clive Van Dams, but that's just too, too far, too, too, too easy. Let me, let me, let me. Let's I'm gonna hit you even more. Movie. Let's go kung, kung fu, fu movie. Kung fu, all right. Kung, right. kung fu, cool. So we're going kung fu. Um, name for me five weapons predominantly used. In kung fu movies, even specific to Shaolin or Wu Tang, five okay. weapons you could think of. So you got the the bronze sword, okay. You One. have you have the bronze sword. You have the um, size. They use the size. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, you have the bow staff. The bow, exactly. I know. I had to. Have, yes. Tofa. Yep, that's with the rings. Spear, the traditional spear. The traditional Short. spear. You had oh. hey, 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 what about the what about the three the three the uh the it's like the nunchuck bow, you know what I'm saying, with the three joints on it? I, I didn't I didn't know I didn't know the name of it, so I didn't know if that would count. You said I don't know I the name to... of it too. I, hey, I'm with you. I'm with so you. They, they wrap it around and <laughs> <laughs> all right. So tell my listeners, man, you provided a lot of value tonight, man. You one of them individuals it's hard to peel back all the layers. I'm going to have to definitely get you on like ASAP again. Tell my listeners where they can find you. How do they follow you? What's the best way to reach out to you? How do we contact Greg Howe? Yeah, so you can, you can follow me on Full Tilt 1911 on Instagram and that's my email uh, Full Tilt 1911 at gmail.com and my Instagram is full tilt 1911 on Instagram. Um, those are don't, that that's where I am the most. You can find me there. And also I have uh, some good information there um, on a uh, five day fast to where, uh, uh, and it just happened. I, I incinerated like 13 pounds. I lost 13 and a half pounds and almost 5%. Uh, I went down 5% of body fat. Um, wow. So, yeah, I got some details there. Um, also, world class uh, personal trainer, um, and and, I, and I, don't, I don't charge at all. If you have tips and you just want longevity, I'm just about uh, helping and just uh, passing on a lot of the knowledge that I have because my time is uh, in my companies. But I do have another skill set that I don't want lost with me. Right. You know, my experiences. So, um, if you want to get in shape, if you want to know, hey. What's the best way to, uh, you know, you know, defend wrestling or or, or deal with wrestling on the jujitsu, uh, whatever. You know, if, if you want to know anything that, that re- regarding physical performance, hit me up. I don't charge anything. I, I most most importantly just want to have a dialogue with you. That's what's up, man. So hey, once again. We really appreciate you. Thank you for joining the movement. All that information will be in the show notes below. My man, my friend, my frat brother, Mr. Greg Howe. Shout out for coming on the show, man. Peace, brother. Blue dog. Appreciate you, Q. Appreciate it. Tune in for next week's episode featuring Tracy Taylor. I have a great one coming your way. Get ready. Buckle up. It's about to go down. Signing out. Roy Robb into The Last Dragon.